All right. All right, settle down. I know you guys are excited. Because today we're going to start talking about synchronization. Yeah. Woohoo, that's right. All right. Some irrational exuberance about synchronization. Um, all right, so today we're going to finish talking about thread states. I'll sort of wrap up the uh, abstraction part of our introduction to uh, CPU multiplexing. And then we're going to talk about uh, how to sort of handle these unruly creatures that, blah, blah, these cre creatures that I'm already having trouble talking. This is going to be a long hour. Um, these creatures that we've created, right? So uh, we've created this, this notion of threads. Uh, we're going to use them to do multi-threaded programming. The operating system in particular is going to want to do a lot of multi-threaded programming for all the reasons that we described on Friday, but we need to find ways to do this safely. And uh, that involves both figuring out how to coordinate between threads, but also how to make sure that when multiple threads are accessing shared state, those accesses are done safely and correctly. Um, all right, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, there's a poll that I just posted on the Piazza website about the date for the exam. So it'll either be, these are your two choices, either the Wednesday before spring break or the Wednesday after spring break. Um, people seem to be sort of split about this. I'm happy to do either. Um, either way, we'll do exam review on the Monday before the exam. So if that's before spring break, it'll be the the 10th. If it's after spring break, it'll be the Monday after, after spring break, all right? OK, any questions about sort of ministrivia stuff? I see people coming to office hours. That's great. Looks like people are starting the assignments. So that's also great um, because <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't care, you know. Um, but well, that's not true. I do want you guys to do the assignments. So I do care. Uh, but it's good for you to start the assignments because they're hard. Um, all right, any questions about the material we covered last week? We started talking about uh, CPU abstractions. We looked at how the processor helps the operating system in certain ways to do some of these things. Any questions about this? Just a small amount of review today. All right. So then what, what constitutes a context switch? Yeehaw. Context switch is the process of what? Must have been a good weekend. <laughs> At least for you. No, I'm not. Friday. Switching between two threads. Yeah, switching between two threads. Stopping one thread from executing, starting another thread. That's a context switch, right? All right. What is a private thread state? What thread state do we usually consider to be private to a particular thread? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ariel. What do we usually consider to be private thread state? Yeah, no one had any questions, Damien. Registers, okay, you got the easy one. What else? Yeah? Stack. And the stack, right? Stack is technically not necessarily private, but the registers definitely are, right? Uh, context switching equates the illusion of what? There we go. All right, I should just ask everybody to speak out loud. All right, so um, what we didn't get to last time, which we'll briefly talk about today, we've, we've, been, we've been kind of, you know, some of these things that I put up as stuff that sort of kind of seeped into our, our, our lexicon anyway. Um, when we talk about threads, particularly at the operating system level, we frequently talk about the operating system having threads in multiple states, right? So what would it probably mean for a thread to be running? It's not hard. Yeah, it's actually executing instructions on some CPU core. At that moment in time, it's, it's one of the cores is in use, and it's in use by this thread, right? All right, what about ready? Uh, from the perspective, what do it mean for a thread to be ready? Yeah, I did, yeah. It's ready to run, but uh, it's not currently occupying the space. Yeah, so th there's nothing stopping this thread from running, but it's not actually running, right? Why, why would this be the case? So it's waiting, right? But why is it waiting? Yeah. 
Yeah, but why why isn't it running it already? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the other cores, hopefully, the other cores are busy, right? And so this thread is runnable, but it's actually not running, right? All right, and, and these could use it interchangeably. So waiting, blocked, sleeping. What, is this, what does this terminology represent? What would a thread in this state be? James? Yeah, so, so these threads are usually stopped because they perform some kind of synchronous operation that, that requires the kernel's help, right? So they're waiting for a packet to arrive on the network. They're waiting for a disk read to complete or something. And because of the type of system call that they've made, they actually cannot be, they, they cannot continue until this event occurs, right? So when you perform a read call in your C program, when the read call completes, you expect that the data that you asked to be read is there, right? And so until the disk gets around to doing what you asked, you cannot continue executing and you're referred to as being blocked, right, or sleeping. All right, so let's talk about the, so, and then when we talk about scheduling, we frequently talk about transitions between these states and what causes them, right? You'll see these sort of fancy state transition diagrams. I don't have a fancy state transition diagram. I just have a list, right? So moving from what, what is this sort of action that takes a thread from actually being running to being ready? So the thread was running, and now it's ready. It's a context switch, right? And specifically, it's, a de it's, a, it's being descheduled, right? So I stop the thread. Remember, a context switch can refer to the process of either starting the thread or stopping the thread, right? So in this case, I've context switched the thread off the CPU, right? I saved its state, and uh, the CPU is now ready to be used by another thread, right? What about going from running to the waiting state? How could this happen? I heard an answer. Yeah. Asking for some type of resource. Yeah, so like making a system call, right? And particularly a blocking system call, right? So a system call where I've asked the kernel, please don't continue to run me until this call completes, right? Looks a lot like a function call, right? What about going from the waiting state to the ready state? Why would this? happen. Yeah, but why would it unblock? Yeah, whatever, whatever I was waiting for happened, right? So the disk read is done, right? The data is in the buffer in my address space, and now I can continue to execute, right? What about from the ready to the running state? So this is the context, but it's also the process of being what? Scheduled, Scheduled right? And we'll, so we'll talk a lot more about this decision right here in a couple of weeks when we talk about scheduling. Maybe next week, actually. And what about, OK, what about here? Running to terminated. This indicates that the terminator has arrived in your operating system, right? Yeah, either it exited, which is something the threads can do, right? Or it hit some sort of exception, right? And to some, to some degree, thread exit and process exit are, are kind of related. Right? If I have multiple threads, I can allow those threads to exit without exiting the process. But if those threads can, can hit an exception, the whole process may be terminated as well. Right? All right. And, and if you guys have started assignment one, you've probably seen some of the data structures that OS 161 uses to organize threads into these different groups. Right? Because these, these groups are important when I do scheduling. Yeah? So for the first one running to ready, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a great point, right? So I can also, if I, if I want to voluntarily give up the CPU, and this is not actually something we've talked about, you'll, but you'll see this in some of the OS161 source code. If I want to voluntarily say, hey, I'm done, you know, and frequently this is done more often in the operating system than it's done in user programs, I can make a call to a function called yield, right? And yield simply tells the operating system, or the scheduler, if I'm inside the operating system, this thread is still ready to run. It just doesn't want to be running right now. Right? And there's a variety of different reasons that a thread might choose to yield. Right? It might say, there might be some more important work to do, but I still want to be scheduled if, if, there, is, uh, if there are processor cores available. Right? So yeah, there is a, usually a way to move directly between these states. It's a good, good observation. Any other questions about thread state transition? Oh, wait, yeah.
It is. Say it. I didn't. I'm and then top of all that, if, if there is a waiting threat, yeah. And it got the resource. Right. But before it turned out to be ready, and some some other threats take out the. Okay, so that's a, so um, when I move here, right? Usually, what happens is when I go from the running to the waiting queue, it means that there's some resource that I've asked for that I haven't yet been able to use, right? So what would happen here is let's say I'm, let's use the example of a read system call, right? I make the read system call. The operating system system says, okay, well the disk is busy right now, so I've got to put you on the on the wait queue, right? I start waiting. At some point, the disk gets around to reading my data. Right? And at some point, the operating system gets around to writing the data back into the place in my address space where it's supposed to be. Right? At that point, I can continue to execute. Right? But however, during that period of time, a lot of other people may have used the disk. Right? And in fact, between the time that the disk finishes servicing my request and the time I start to run again, it's possible that that disk was used by many other parts, many other threads. Right? So yes, yeah, certainly. You know, the, the waiting just means I'm still waiting for something to happen, right? Once that thing happens, I don't necessarily run immediately, right? It just means now I can run. That's in particular why, we, why there's no transition, and in many operating systems, there is no transition between the waiting state and the running state, right? I don't go immediately back to running, right? Once I'm finished waiting for the disk, the operating system says, oh, okay, w I can run this thread again, right? I get put, and then the next time the scheduler runs, it will notice that it might put me on a course. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. so the, the process of prioritizing system resources is not really expressed here at all, right? Certainly, once I start to wait, I might wait behind uh, other processes that, that ask for the resource after me. Sure, absolutely. It's a good, good, good point. These are good questions. Any other questions before we go on? Yeah. So, uh, uh huh. So yeah, so the, the process of choosing which threads to run from the threads that are, are able to run is a process called scheduling, right? And there, it, random is one way of scheduling, uh, and it's not a very good one. But we'll talk more about scheduling algorithms in, in about a week, right? So right now, it's just important to, to know about these transitions. This, yeah, so, so choosing which of the threads that are ready, because normally on a system, there might be many threads that are ready to run at any moment in time many more threads than the number of cores that I have to, to, act, to run them on, right? Determining which threads to run is a very hard problem, and there's still a lot of interesting sort of research and development going on in this area, right? But, but that is something we'll come back to in about a week. All right, great questions. Any other questions? That's a chin scratch, not a question. OK, good. All right. So, so now, and, and now we're going to talk about, we're gonna, and this is something that, you know, um, to, to some degree, synchronization. How many people have, have sort of studied synchronization in depth before? OK. Yeah, so it's too bad. Um, the, 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 the concept of synchronization is not really something that, um, I don't know how to put this. I mean, you, you, you could talk, you can learn about synchronization in other contexts, right? Synchronization and synchronization primitives are tools that we use to solve a certain set of problems, right? One of the reasons that we talk about them in operating systems is because operating systems have a lot of these problems, right? And so synchronization becomes extremely important to be able to design and build operating systems correctly, right? But to some degree, synchronization is a little bit orthogonal to the core, to the core concept of operating systems, but it comes up very naturally here when we talk about threads, right? Because essentially, you know, now we've created this illusion of concurrency, right? And you know, concurrency is this really nice abstraction. It allows us to break down our programs. It allows us to think about them in, much, in a much more intuitive way, right? I can think about many different threads running inside my program rather than one big thread that has to do everything in every loop and can never block. Otherwise, my entire program looks unresponsive, right? That's not a great way to write programs. And of course, threading and you know, creating a lot of different consumers of the CPU also means that it's very likely that if one part of my program or part of the system starts blocking, waiting for some slow resource, there's some other work I can do, right? Which is great. And part of the goal of the entire sort of CPU multiplexing and, and abstraction by the operating system is to keep the CPU occupied, right? The CPU is really, really fast. The other parts of the system are slow. If I can keep the CPU busy, then I'm generally doing a pretty good job. Remember, the CPU is also very expensive, right? So if you paid for, you know, like 16 cores on your system, you probably want those cores to be doing work. You know, I, I actually, when I was, uh, my brother was in college, he had a roommate 
who had, had shelled out for one of these really, really early, it wasn't even a multi-core system, it was actual like multi-processor you know, system with like a motherboard with two sockets in it and stuff like that. And um, he had bought this machine from Dell and they had, they had shipped it to him with like Windows ME or something, you know, one of these like very early terrible versions of <laughs> Windows on it. And there was like a really big problem with this machine configuration, which was Windows ME was incapable of using more than one processor. And so there was a processor that he had paid like a lot of money for, right? And the motherboard, which he had paid even more money for to have two sockets and stuff like that. And that processor was just sitting there dark, right? It wasn't, I'm not, I don't think it was actually even being initialized by the operating system, right? So you don't want this, right? Eventually he upgraded and, you know, everything went a lot faster, right? But, but yeah, so that's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want processors sitting there unused. Um, Unfortunately, this, this idea of concurrency also creates problems, right? And the problem is specifically that there are now potentially multiple things happening at the same time. And that transition between those things can be really, really unpredictable and is in general something that, that you can't make very many assumptions about as a program, right? You know, when you start writing multi-threaded applications, unless, you know, you do something to prevent this from happening, at any moment, one of the part of your application could be stopped and the other part can run, right? And this can happen basically at any time, right? So we're going to talk about two distinct set of problems created by, or by concurrency, and we're going to talk about the types of synchronization tools that are created to solve these problems, right? One problem is, is coordination. So you remember we, we talked a little bit about how writing multi-threaded applications was supposed to be, in many cases, better than using multiple processes because <coughs> communication between threads was easier, right? But that doesn't make it trivial. And there's a number of different mechanisms that have been created to allow sort of effective communication between threads that are trying to cooperate to get something done, right? And equally important is this idea of correctness. So when I start having multiple threads accessing the same data structures, we need to make sure that those accesses are consistent. Right? And in general, this is because those accesses, again, can occur sort of in any order. Right? When you start to think about multiple threads within your operating system, you have to assume that those threads' operations can be interleaved in any sort of arbitrary way. Right? So today we'll start by talking about correctness, and then later in the week we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about coordination. Right? And as we've talked about in the past, the operating system is a natural place to learn how to use these mechanisms if, if only because they're so important, right, inside the operating system because the operating system's job is to multiplex resources, right? So, you know, you may be able to get away with writing your little, you know, uh, awesome new text-based game using one thread, right? But as soon as there's two processes on the operating system, all these concurrency problems come up, right? Um, and yeah, so the operating system, and even internally, the operating system frequently uses a lot of extra threads, right? So there's usually at least, you can think about being one thread of execution per process uh, or per th user thread going on within the operating system, but frequently there are many others as well, because there's all sorts of things that the operating system is doing in the background that require their own threading and their own coordination and correctness mechanisms. And then finally, we have lots and lots of shared state, right? The shared state is normally associated with the fact that at the underlying level, these are shared resources, right? And of course, finally, if you get the synchronization wrong in your program, your program crashes. If you get synchronization wrong in the operating system, everybody's program crashes, right? So people tend not to like that. Um, so, and, and this is something that as you guys are working on assignment one and assignment two, this is the sort of the, the mantra to keep in your mind, right? Unless you do something about it, right? Unless you is explicitly synchronize your threads. Those threads can be run in any order, can be stopped and started at any time, and may remain stopped for arbitrary lengths of time. So at any point, right? So as you're looking at your code, you're saying, okay, I do this, 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 and then this other thread is also trying to access the same data structure. You have to think all of the different ways that those two threads execution can be stopped, right? Because essentially, at any moment, in the middle of an instruction, you can be stopped, put on the wait queue. The other thread can run, it can do whatever it wants to. When you wake up, the world may be very different, right? The other thread may have done things, and memory may have changed. And so these are, these are the things that you have to keep in mind, and this is the reason that we talk about using these synchronization problems, right? And again, these, th this isn't, you know, I just want to make sure that there's a positive spin to this, right? This is done in order to make the CPU 
available to all of the threads on the system and create the illusion of concurrency. So this is a good thing, but it forces us to make uh, some adjustments as programmers, right? All right. So this is so. Let's go through the you know the, the canonical um, you know uh, somebody is is paying for their grade in this class uh, example, and this happens every year, of course, right? Because this is how I you know, like I said, you guys make your own grades, right? You know, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> You know, bribery, pure and simple, right? You know, you can kind of extrapolate from this point like what you need to get an A, you know? <laughs> um, all right, so it's, assume I have $1,000 in my bank account, all right? And the two of you are trying to make concurrent deposits. One of you is depositing 1,000, other is depositing 2,000, right? So how much money should there be in my bank account when you guys are finished? I hope, <laughs> let's try that again, how much? Four thousand dollars, right? Yeah, this is just this is fairly simple addition. Um, all right. So, and, and let's say that you know that this is the function that you've decided to implement, uh, right? And and you know, okay, this is pretty straightforward, right? So, what do I do here, right? I mean, I I have this function called get balance that returns the amount of money I have in my account. Then when you give me some, I add it, right? Large amount added to my balance, and then I uh, and then I write the balance back, right? And I'm finished. And then, yeah, then I, there's some sort of like text message that I get right here with the, you know. Um, okay, so this is pretty straightforward, right? You know, pretty, you know, pretty simple uh, piece of C code that you would write. Okay, so let, let's see the number of different ways that, that this code can cause problems, right? So in the best case, right, and let's say again, these, these two transactions are happening simultaneously in two separate threads, right? So here's the best case for me, right? One thread runs. When it's done, my balance is 2,000. This thread is deposited 1,000. And then the second thread runs. When it's done, my balance is 4,000. So that's good, right? That's kind of what I want to happen, right? All right, so now let's look at a, a slightly more problematic example, right? And, you, and, and one of the things to notice here is that here, these two threads essentially, it, it was almost like there weren't two threads at all, right? These two threads, one thread ran to completion, the second thread ran to completion, right? Frequently when you start to see problems with multi-threaded programming is when this doesn't happen, right? If, if it's really just one single thread, a lot of things work really well. What happens, what causes problems is interleaving, right? So let's say that the red thread starts to run and he gets my account balance. And then contact switch. And the blue thread runs. And he gets my account balance, right? Okay, and now contact switch back to the red thread and he deposits his $1,000. And at this point, everything looks fine, right? Got $2,000, that's how much I should have. The problem is, once the blue thread completes, how much money do I have? $3,000, right? Just not what I wanted, right? OK, so here's one example of how these two threads, uh, about unpredictable interleaving between these two threads can cause me to not have as much money as I would like, right? And this is an important problem for me, which is why we're talking about it at length. Um, but, but again, these are not, and the thing I want to emphasize, these are not sort of weird corner cases. When you start doing multi-threaded programming, this is the normal case, right? This is what will happen. Okay, so let's look at the worst case scenario, right? The worst case scenario is red thread runs, it gets the balance, and now I have $1,000, right? What, what happens now? Context, context switch, you don't just have to say context switch, just speaking to the blue. Context switch, right, boom, blue thread runs, and now the blue thread runs to, to completion, right? So now at the end of this, he, I have $3,000, right? Now what happens? Context switch, back to the red thread, when the red thread is finished, I have $2,000, right? So this is unfortunate, right? Now, now we've come up with four possible answers, I th sorry, three, I think that's all there, there are. But someone, I think one year, maybe convinced me that there was another possible way that this could work out, right? So, so this, this uh, demonstrates what's, what's sometimes known as a race condition, right? It's a little bit of a weird, a weird terminology, although it's, I don't know, I've always kind of liked it, it's kind of a cute term. Uh, who can define a race condition? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't call it an actual race. There's no winner here, right? Yeah, what's? Uh, when the output is dependent on some time variable. 
Yeah, so essentially, and again, this is the, the, from, you know, best I could do was quote Wikipedia, I think, is when the output of a process is unexpectedly, unexpectedly dependent on timing or some other event. Okay? And the, and the thing to keep in mind is this unexpectedly, right? There are cases when you write concurrent programs where this, this type of behavior may not bother you as much, right? But in this case, we expected me to have $4,000 when this example completed. Right? And I would expect that, right? and my bank would expect that. Right? Um, and unfortunately, because this example wasn't properly synchronized, the behavior depended now on the scheduler. Right? So depending on how the scheduler ran, the output could, could vary right? when it wasn't supposed to. Okay? So now let me introduce a new, a new illusion. Right? So, so we had this, and it seems weird, because it seems like we're backing up right here. So for, first of all, we talked about concurrency, right? the illusion that multiple things were happening at the same time, which was a good thing. It was a way to keep the CPU busy. Right? And this required the ability to stop and start a thread at any time right? in order to make sure that I could hide these hardware latencies and make the CPU available fairly to all the threads on the system. I had to be able to preempt threads and allow another thread to run. Right? The, the new sort of illusion that we're going to start talking about right now is this idea of atomicity, right? And atomicity is sort of the, the opposite of concurrency, right? Atomicity is the illusion that a bunch of actions that actually occurred separately from the perspective of the system occur all at the same time, right? So, and, and this actually requires, again, sort of the opposite of the first thing, right? So the first concurrency requires the ability to stop threads at any moment. And atomicity requires giving threads some control over thread scheduling. Right? And this is usually done in a sort of a very limited local way. Right? So it allows threads to say, particularly in the operating system, do not stop me right now. Right? I need to keep running. And, um, and to also to prevent other threads from overlapping their execution with each other. Right? If we go back to the example quickly, if either one of these, well, way too far, way too far back. So I, if either one of the, oh my gosh. OK, so either, if either one of these threads could have prevented the other thread from executing while they were executing, we would have been back in this nice first example. Right? The first thread runs, it finishes, the second thread runs, the second thread finishes. And this is essentially what we'll get to today. Right? Um, there, so there's an interesting principle here, though, that I want to point out, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting design choice. And this design choice, unfortunately, was made like, um, 50 years ago, right? So if you don't like it, you can blame like old geezers, even older than me, right? Like I was, you can't even blame me for this. Um, and actually, uh, one of the first operating system. How many people have heard of Dijkstra's algorithm? Okay, good. That's good. Um, Dijkstra actually also designed like computer operating systems, which not everybody knows. Um, and one of Dijkstra's early ideas was the fact that you could build a a provably correct operating system, right? By careful use of some of the, in fact, the syn first synchronization primitive we're going to look at has functions that are named after Dutch pseudo words. They're not even Dutch words, actually, but they're Dutch slang, I guess. And that's, that's in honor of Dijkstra because it was a primitive that he invented. So he had this idea that you could build this operating system that was actually like provably correct, right? And I could prove things about it and say it will never crash. Um, no one else tried that again for like many, many, many years, right? And essentially what operating system designers did is they focused on making systems that were fast, right? And then you fixed the problems with them, right? <laughs> it was like you made, the, and, and I mean, I don't know. I mean, to, to some degree, Windows is a great example of this actually happening, right? Fast and usable, had a lot of features, and oh, it crashed a little bit, right? And then over years and years and years and years, as they basically like adopted a lot of the innovations that Unix had done decades before, they fixed a lot of the problems, and now it's a lot more stable. But the point is that a lot of systems have started with speed and made safety sort of the optimization goal, right? And there's actually some new research into this, the, the, other, the other way around, which would be, let me start with a provably safe system, and then I'll put my programming effort in to make it faster, right? And that's kind of an interesting design shift, right? All right, so the, the atomicity idea that we're going to introduce to solve some of these simple uh, problems with concurrency is an idea of what's called a critical section. And a critical section allows us to create a block of code that looks atomic from the perspective of other threads outside of the critical section. 
right? So a critical section allows me to create one piece of code to, that to other threads executing that piece of code looks like it happened sort of all at once, right? So the, the mechanism that I'm using for critical sections is I'm only going to allow one thread inside the critical section at any given point in time. Once a thread enters the critical section, all other threads that try to get in the critical section will have to wait until that first thread completes. And to some degree, it, makes, it gives me the ability to make this one piece of code look atomic. Right? It looks like it all happens at once from the perspective of other people who are using that same function. Right? So going back to our example about the bank deposit. So what lines, so the, the first question is, what's the, and, and critical sections are, I don't know why this isn't up here. Critical sections are frequently used to protect some piece of state that requires multiple operations to manipulate, right? So what's the shared state uh, that's being accessed? We'll go out of order. What's the shared state here that's being accessed by each thread? Yeah, this, this balance, the, the, the account balance, right? And, and for some reason, I forced you to use these stupid getters and setters to do this, right? But, you know, it, like, you, you could imagine that the actual code to implement this would have several variables that it would need to update sort of together, right? But anyway, so it's the account balance, and you're, you're modifying the account balance by using these two functions. What's the local state that's private to each thread? What's that? There's only one piece of state here, so it shouldn't be a hard answer. It's this, right? It's the amount of money that I actually have, right? And the account is, is the shared state. So in order to fix this piece of code, what part of this function needs to look atomic to other threads that are executing this function? What, what several instructions need to look like they happen at the same time? One through three. Right? Do I have a little call out? No. So if I can make this operation, right, the process of copying the balance into my local variable, modifying it, and then storing it back, if I can make these three lines of code look atomic, then I can fix the race condition that this code suffers from. Does this make sense, everybody? I just want to pause here. Questions about this? Yeah. part of the critical section, it's just more efficient to do so, right? Like, you could, like, lock at Guaha's initializing and then... Guaha's. <laughs> Guaha's. <laughs> what is Gua? Me. <laughs> and, then you, <laughs> and then you could unlock after you've initialized GWA has, and then you could lock again at put balance, right? Could, okay, so, so, okay, this is a good question. So could I, now, now I haven't talked about a lock yet, right? We're going to get to locks, but, but you guys have probably started doing assignment one, so you know something about locks, which is great, okay? But let's, I'm, I'm still just talking about critical sections, right? I'm going to take a piece of code and make a look, at, a look atomic, right? And the suggestion is, if I just pull this, pull this in, and then I end the critical section, and I start another critical section around line three, would that be the same thing? How many people think that works? How many people think it doesn't work? Okay. Mac, why doesn't it work? Because if you um, don't have a critical, critical section from 1, 2, 3, the other thread could get the account after you got the balance in the account, and then it could put a new balance in there. Um, which kind of yeah, I need, to, I need to make sure that my local variable stays in sync with this global variable. Right. So if I if I you know if I took your suggestion, I would say get balance. This would be you know a thousand. The other thread would get two thousand. Then we do our local modifications, and then whichever one of us gets to put the balance in last wins. Right. But I still have a race there. Right. Does that make sense? I could I could fix this with a lock, but actually I, I don't think even a lock would work in the way that you want it to work. There, right. Good question. Any other questions about this example? It's quite simple. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I don't care. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, so th that's a good point, right? I probably need to put this inside the critical section unless I want to get like a bunch of just like weird things like who's, t 
<laughs> yeah, like someone wrote a really bad grade. They just took money out of my bank account. <laughs> I, actually, I mean, I, I, can, I can say that there is no relationship with the amount of money you put in my bank account in your grade, but there definitely is a relationship with the amount of money you steal from me in your grade. <laughs> um, all right, so, so anyway, so that's, yeah, that, that would be better to do. Right? Good, good point. Any other questions about this? Yeah. What, 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 okay, so this is a good point. What will putting the fourth line inside the critical section do in this particular example? Yeah. It'll mean that my, the, so assuming that the notifications arrive in the order in which the threads execu in, execute, it'll mean that I get, balance, I get notifications that make sense, right? So the final notification I get should be 4,000, right? If I don't put four inside the critical section, the final notification I get, assuming that the notifications arrive in the same order, could be 3,000, right? Which would confuse me. Okay, that's a good, that's a good point. Any other questions about that? All right, so we start talking about critical sections. And, and operating systems are full of critical sections, right? And have a variety of different mechanisms to create critical sections. And that's frequently because there's variables and different types of data structures that just require multiple operations to manipulate, right? Manipulating them in a coherent way requires, and this is a stupid contrived example, right? But you can imagine like linked lists, for example. Right? How do I remove an item in a linked list in a threaded environment safely? I've got a bunch of different things I've got to do. Right? I've got to like take, I've got to delete that element. I've got to correct the pointers. If it's doubly linked, I have to correct the back pointer. Right? So there's a bunch of things that have to happen together. Right? If somebody sees the linked list sort of halfway through, I'm in trouble. Because right? then it looks weird. It's like, oh man, you know, that's a pointer. Like I was walking it, and then it ended. You know, because if they got there, and then you, and then you you know, deleted that pointer, this would be a better example for next year, actually, then yeah, I just might fall off the list, right? So a lot of data structures have these, you know, dependencies between various things, and they require, when you start using them in a multi-threaded way, that you're careful about how you modify it, right? So we start talking about the design requirements for critical sections. Clearly, mutual exclusion is important, right? And what mutual exclusion means is that no two threads should be able to be in the critical section at the same time, right? That's the definition. So anything that doesn't fulfill that is not going to implement a critical section, right? The second one is progress, right? So as threads queue up on a critical section, we want them to eventually be able to get inside, right? So you know, if I create a critical section around a particular block of code and a thread has to wait for it, eventually that thread should be able to finish and continue on, right? And this is related to performance, right? So in, in general, when we think about how to design operating systems, and really just how to design any multi-threaded system, you want to keep the parts of your system that are critical sections or the parts that you lock around or whatever, as we start talking about these synchronization primitives, you want to keep those parts small, right? Making them big means that you're slowing other people down and you're sort of monopolizing the CPU and interferes with scheduling. There's lots of other problems, right? The problem is making them small is frequently hard to do, right? <laughs> It's a lot easier, you know, for, so for example, for assignment three, there are some really sort of neat slash, I guess they're neat from my perspective now, maybe nasty from your perspective, sort of uh, synchronization bugs that you can get into when you start to implement swapping. Some students have solved them by just putting large portions of the code inside a huge critical section, <laughs> right? And that works. It's just really slow and ugly. And, but, you know, we really can't really tell. <laughs> but anyway, so, so there, but when you look at real modern operating systems, they do a lot of work to re reduce the granularity of the amount of code that runs inside these, right? Okay. And, and in general, when we start talking about how to implement these, there's, there's two ways to sort of make sure that, yeah, you had a question. Aha, uh, uh, uh -huh. yes, okay. So that would be, don't stop, right? So one way of creating a critical section is to make sure that threads don't stop executing inside of them. Right? And now, now for some of this, this discussion is going to be now more specific to operating systems themselves. Right? 
regular user programs don't really have a way to tell the operating system not to deschedule them, right? That would defeat the purpose of preemptive scheduling, right? Inside the operating system, however, there are ways to make sure that I don't stop running, right? Um, so on unit processors, I, I don't know, I should probably just, you know, just make this part of the slide go away now, you know, because it's, it's like historically sort of antiquated. On unit processor systems, there was this old way of making sure that I could continue to execute if I was running with kernel privilege. And the way was simple. It was just disable the timer interrupt. Remember, the timer interrupt is what triggers scheduling. And if I mask the timer interrupt and every other interrupt on the system, right? So if I load up an interrupt mask, that essentially means that there is nothing that can happen that will cause the interrupt handlers to fire, then the the timer in upper number fire, there'll be no scheduling, and none of the hardware devices on the system will be able to request attention. I will continue to run until I put, on, I put interrupts back on, right? And again, now that we have multiple cores, this just does not work, right? Because I can stop, you know, people from running on my core, but I can't stop someone else from running on another core. Right, so, you know, and, and this is the sort of, if you guys have started assignment one, this is the SPLX sort of design pattern that we really try to discourage you from using because it doesn't work, right? Because I can say, okay, well, when I enter the critical section, I'll turn off interrupts and now I'm inside and no one else is running, but then there's this other core, right? And some guy in the other core is now inside the critical section too and we've lost that mutual exclusion requirement that we need, right? So this doesn't work. Um, so in, in general, what we need a way, especially on multi-core systems, we need a way to stop other threads from entering the critical section, right? We need a way to signal them saying, this critical section, I'm inside the critical section, you, and, and you can't come inside until I do this, right? And, and here's another place where hardware comes to the rescue, right? Um, and Part, and and this, is, this is partly because once I get to multiple cores, there's really, you know, it really becomes difficult and, and potentially very ugly. There are ways to do this. I think it's like a Google sort of interview question how to do this without some of these special hardware features. But in general, we use these hardware features to make this work, right? So the way that we do this is we utilize special instructions that are provided by hardware for enabling this kind of cross-processor synchronization, cross-core synchronization, right? And the, I'm going to provide pseudocode for two examples of these. We'll toss, talk about test and set. But just to make sure that people understand, these are not implemented in C, right? This is something that the hardware provides as an instruction, right? So as part of the instruction set, there'll be something akin to a single instruction that performs this, this computation, right? C code is just a kind of a, club, a nice way of, of implementing it or, or showing you how it works, right? So what a test and set does is it, so it stores the, the I give it a, a pointer to a target and I give it a value that I want to set, right? It sets the target to the value I pass in and it returns the old value, right? And again, it does this atomically. And on multi-core systems, this is something that I use to operate on a byte of memory, right? So I say test and set this particular byte of memory, and the processor coordinates with other processors to make sure that that happens atomically, right? So I could say test and set zero, and it will set the memory to zero and return the old value atomically with respect to other cores, right? There's also something called a compare and swap, right, that can be used inside a test case, right? So what compare and swap does is it actually allows you to say, if the value is this, set it to something else, if not, you know, return something that indicates that the, that the swap wasn't done, right? So I could say, if the target is equal to some value, then set it to this new value I gave you and return a value that indicates that you actually performed the swap. Otherwise, return a value that indicates that the swap wasn't done, right? Both of these are, again, these low-level hardware instructions that are used and are implemented by, they, they require synchronization with other cores, right? Because in order for these to work safely, they have to make sure that two test and sets that occur to the same memory address on multiple cores are, are implemented atomically, right? So again, if, if, I, if the hardware didn't do this for me, right, what could happen? Both cores could, um, both, let's say that the, the target was zero. Core one tried to set it to one, core two tried to set it to two, right? 
So what, what should happen in that case? Let's say I have a, a test that's out in core one for, let's say the value of, at that memory is currently zero, and I have two test sets taking place, one on core one, one on core two. Core one is setting it to one, core two is setting it to two. What should happen? There's two possible answers. Yeah. Yeah, they should execute in some sequence, right? Meaning that either core one should run first, meaning that core one should return zero and set it to one, and core two should return one and set it to two, or core two runs first, core two sets it to two, returns zero, core one sets it to one and returns two, right? I wish I had that on the slide because that's a little complicated. Um, what should not happen? Yeah, so the, the, what I'm trying to avoid is that core, core one runs and core two kind of overlaps with it and maybe core one and core two both get zero, but then somebody sets it to one first and someone sets it to two, right? So in, in order for this to work atomically, one of them should get one and the other should get zero. Well, if, if, anyway, we got it right the first time, right? They have, to, they have to appear atomic to the two cores, right? Both of them should not get the same value. Right? Let's put it that way. All right, so most processors provide either one of these instructions. And on some systems, what we do is we implement, in soft, we implement something like this in software using lower level instructions that provide similar guarantees, right? Um, so on, I, I can't remember, what, is, what does OS 161 provide? Is it test and set? Yeah, there's, there's another, there's something called test, test and set too, which I can't remember what that does, except it, maybe it does another test. Um, yeah, so, so one of the things that's, that's an interesting sort of story about the, the recent evolution of computing, right, is that these sort of synchronization uh, primitives that were built, so a lot of the synchronization primitives we're talking about were built in the days of single processor systems, right? Your processor had one core, and there was a specific set of mechanisms that I used to make that to make that system run fast, right? And then I started having multiple cores, right? And, and major operating systems underwent, you know, significant rewrites and redesigns to handle multiple cores. You know, Linux has this thing called the big kernel lock, which on Unix processor systems used to be grabbed in various places to prevent certain things from happening. And then once you got to multiprocessor systems, it started to get really bad because grabbing it actually could prevent a lot of other things from happening on other cores, right? So a lot of operating systems went through major redesigns to figure out how to scale to small numbers of cores, right? Like two or four. Now that we have like 64 core systems, 128 core systems, all those, and, and the important part of this is these cores frequently provide what's called cache coherent shared memory. That means that every processor on the system, every core on the system, sorry, has the same view of memory and the cores have to work together to make, their, make sure that memory, view of memory is, is what's called cache coherent, right? So if I write a one and you do a read, you should get the value that I just wrote, right? And what's interesting is that a lot of these synchronization mechanisms haven't scaled very well, right? So if you think a little bit about the type of coordination that has to occur for a multi-core system to implement something like a test and set, frequently it does not scale as you go to four processors, eight processors, 16 processors. And so there's actually been work on addressing this through better synchronization primitives and sort of fixing bottlenecks, right? So there was, there was a paper maybe four or five years ago where these guys at MIT just spent a bunch of time hacking to, and so that Linux would scale up to 64 cores, right? They just took Linux, they tried to run these benchmarks, and what they saw is that the performance started to degrade as the core count went up, didn't scale properly. And what they found is a lot of it was due to these bad synchronization mechanisms. And so they went in and just fixed a bunch of the problems. Right? And then they got much better scaling behavior. Right? And then, of course, as we go to many, many, as, as you start to think about machines with thousands of cores, the architecture of these machines is itself kind of an interesting question. Right? Providing the shared memory abstraction on millions of cores is just kind of ridiculous. Because right? it just doesn't work. Right? The hardware itself just starts to not scale. Anymore. All right, so let me, let me quickly finish uh, today by just mo quickly modifying the bank example to use this test and set mechanism. So here's how I implement my critical section. 
I set the test and set here, and then I clear the test and set here, and of course this works, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Does this work? What happens here? Have I accomplished anything? No, not really. Um, because I don't, there's no test, there's no actual condition in here, right? I, all the threads are doing is testing this, setting and testing, te te setting this variable without actually consuming the output from the test and set, right? So I, the, I need to do something up here, right? This is potentially correct, and we'll fix it on Wednesday, but I need to do something a little bit more sophisticated here. So we'll start here on Wednesday, and we'll keep talking about synchronization.